Hi, and welcome back to Show and Tell. I'm Billy. I'm not live with you, although I am alive. This is an image of me, and I'm doing a voiceover here because today's whole presentation is all uh, film footage and like almost like a slideshow. But before we get started, I wanted to remind you that you can find me on Ravelry and on Instagram as Billy Toy. And if you like this episode, please be kind enough to hit the like button down below, the thumbs up. And anytime you want to subscribe, ring the little bell, uh, click on that little bell symbol, and then you'll be notified when I'm out with a new episode. So I hope you enjoy this saga of how I came to start designing my first sweater. In a previous episode, we looked at a Scaparelli sweater that was in the Metropolitan Museum, and we also looked at the bow knot black and white Scaparelli from the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Philadelphia also owns this lobster dress by Scaparelli, seen here on the right on Wallace Simpson. This was part of her 1937 trousseau before she married Edward VIII, who you might remember had abdicated his throne. He had been the King of England and he abdicated so that he could marry an American divorcee. Wallace and Edward were quite the fashion icons. Notice her gloves, this beautiful bracelet that she has on, a very elegant handbag, some interesting ornament on her belt, beautiful flower atop her dress, very interesting bodice with buttons and these um, darts over the bust a stunning earring that coordinates with that floral motif and looks like a double strand of maybe coral beads. I don't think those are pearls, but it's just a stunning look. This photograph on the left was taken on their wedding day. And you can see from the card in the center that Edward must have ordered this bracelet to be delivered on May 31st, 1937, just several days before their June 3rd wedding uh, from Van Cleef and Arpels, the famous Harris jewelry house. Um, Le Col is the school of jewelry arts that is supported by the House of Van Cleef and Arpels. And from time to time, they have seminars in New York. And I happened to attend one where they showed this beautiful sapphire and diamond bracelet that Edward gave to Wallace. So you see, this couple had impeccable taste. Enter Thelma, Viscountess Furness. Born Thelma Morgan, she was the twin sister of Gloria Morgan, more commonly known as the mother of Gloria Vanderbilt. You can see what an elegant woman she was, and her parties must have been elegant too. Now, she was married, but having an extramarital affair with Prince Edward VIII. And it was at one of her parties that Edward met Wallace Simpson. So he fell in love with Wallace and left Thelma. And the rest is history. But let's get back to the inspiration for my sweater. Before we talk about this beautiful garment that she's wearing, let's notice her Art Deco earrings and this stunning dress clip. But when I saw this bodice, I don't know if it's the top of an evening gown or a cocktail dress, 
I'm guessing because it looks very black that it's probably a gown. I just found this to be beautiful, especially this little detail in here where it's sheer right up to the edge. This is my inspiration for the sweater that I'm going to try and create. I think it's going to be challenging, um, but my intention is to use mohair in this section and a solid color wool of the same colorway. The next order of business was to choose a color. I didn't want black because it's so hard on the eyes, but I did want it to be more evening oriented. So I wanted to stay with a darker color. And because I've had such success with Sadness Garn, I chose from their color cards number 4054 Deep Vinrod, which translates to Deep Burgundy, because they had it in the silk mohair as well as in the wool. Okay, so I have been waiting for this yarn to arrive because I am going to be walking you through my very first attempt at designing my own pattern. I have a photo for inspiration, which I will show you. The yarn is in here, so let me use my mother, her uh, vintage elk scissors to open this package up with you. Oops. The yarn I ordered is from Sandness Garn. I've had pretty good success with their things because while it's not vintage yarn, it's not indie dyed, so it doesn't have any kind of variegation or anything like that. Um, the colors are really like nice and solid. And the sweater is kind of a two-tone sort of. Some of it is mohair and some of it is solid. Isn't that pretty how, how she did this, my friend Lori? Okay, so the nine mohair by Sandus Garn is called Sunday, and the colorway is 4054. I think it's something like port wine, uh, something with wine, wine coloring. And then the mohair, I think the colorway is the same. Let me find that for you. Um, yeah, 4054, and this is their tin silk mohair. So that's all for right now. We're going to come back and I'll show you my inspiration and some of my sketches. This was my first attempt at making a sketch. I tried to get the angles of the stripes and the general shape. And by using graph paper, I really was trying to get the proper dimensions here. So you can see I, I made like a three inch mark from the center to the edge of the neck. And then I figured that each of these bands was probably about an inch. Anyway, this was my model that I worked off of. This was my first swatch. I thought I was just going to do stripes and figure out how to get those stripes onto some kind of an angle. And I wanted to see um, how the mohair would look against the merino and what my gauge would actually be so I could figure out how many stitches I was gonna need. I realized it would be too difficult to get the stripes going this way, like that, and doing that kind of a uh, decrease over here. I thought it was going to be too hard to just be striping, striping, striping. 
So I got the idea of maybe starting here at a pinpoint and branching out in a pie shape, a wedge shape. So I began swatching in that manner. And I was keeping notes on, on how far up I was going to knit, how many rows up before I introduced this. Like first I would start with a solid color and then at this point, I would start to introduce the mohair. And at this point, I would split mohair into two directions. So I was figuring all of that out as I went and trying to do the geometry of how many rows before I would get to the width that I needed to do the split. And I proceeded along in this way. Here I pinned it onto my blocking board so I could really get a sense of the dimensions of it. And it became apparent to me that while I had the look and the right width of the stripes, it was flaring out much more than I expected it to. And I didn't think that was going to give me the right angle or the right fit. And I realized that this slope was probably um, too, too broad and I would have to rethink now how am I going to get the right kind of shape. Back to the drawing board. I next sketched out in real size where I thought the stripe should be and how wide and my little markings indicated this is a row of solid, this is a row of mohair and so on. And how many stitches I felt I would need to have when I got to this section, which is, if you go back to my photograph of Thelma, this section is not a stripe, but kind of like a, a lopsided wedge shape. And it was here that I realized that this angle is not the same as this angle. They really weren't branching out at the same rise, same rate, same slope. But I was able to use this to lay my knitting down on to see if I was really on track, kind of like a template or pattern. I decided that the neckline probably should have a nice finish to it. So I cast on with an I-cord and proceeded to knit my stripes this way. And um, using a smaller number of stitches for the mohair than I did for the wool because my gauge was a little bit different. And what I would do is as I would be decreasing on this side, I would shift my stitches over by one stitch. And that's how I was going to achieve this angle. But I was doing it at a I was uh, increasing this side at a different rate than I was increasing this side. And all along, I had this template to lay it out on to make sure that I was staying on track. I was so happy when I finished one side and then I was able to do the mirror image. So now I had these two wedges that fit relatively well onto the template that I devised. So I knew I was onto something at this point. And I was pretty happy with how the I-cord edge looked. I was also very aware that down here where that sheer stripe on her dress was, the sheer stripes are gonna to come together, that I was gonna need a little bit more support than just a flimsy edge. So at this point, I'm somewhat happy. Now I'm up to the back. Although the whole front isn't finished, I was satisfied with having those two wedges. Now I'm thinking about well, how am I going to get those wedges to match up with the back. So I thought 
if I provisionally cast on, let's say around under the underarm, and I start working up towards the shoulder, then I'd be able to decrease and do short rows and have a nice smooth shoulder line to create that dolman sleeve that I was going for without having the stair steps that binding off five stitches at a time was going to make. So I thought, yes, try a provisional cast on and work up before you knit an entire back from bottom up to meet the shoulders. So here's my provisional cast on. I use this red scrap wool and here's my burgundy color. So I just knit a few inches and I started to do the short row shaping and I got a nice smooth edge going up around the shoulder. This was my six and a half inches behind the back of the neck, six to six and a half inches that I planned on. And I pinned it out onto my blocking board um, and began to pick up the stitches that were provisionally cast on, all the while ripping out the chain stitch that I had created. Now here's a close-up of how this is looking. You can also see, like I did, that there's a fairly deep ridge here. It's not that the stitches are twisted and it's not that they're off by half a stitch, but there's this deep depression here. Here's a close up of it. And I decided, well, maybe if I block it, I can reduce some of that indentation. Because I certainly wasn't happy with this. Here it is after the blocking. It's somewhat better, but I still wasn't really satisfied. I wanted it to be a better product. No, your eyes are not deceiving you. This is a fresh direct bag. During the pandemic, when we refused to open our door for anyone or anything, the only way we could get food in was to have Fresh Direct deliver it. So about once a month, we would get a huge delivery. And they are now delivering in these large, sturdy, I think they're Tyvek or some kind of material like that. It's waterproof. It's very durable. Um, I have a huge collection of these bags now. And I thought that this might be a very good material because it's flexible and it's not something that could rip like a, a piece of brown paper. I thought this might make a good pattern. So I decided to pull one of these out and cut it open. I know it looks too pretty to tear apart, but I thought it was for a pretty good cause. And as I said, I do have quite a few of them. So here's my remnants. But I cut out the shape of the shoulders and the top part that my wedges fit onto perfectly. So I pinned the wedges onto this white backing. It's somewhat flexible. And I started an I-cord cast on for the back of the neck, which you see at the top of the screen. At this point, I've knit a few rows of the back and I've attached it to the side panels. And my scheme is that I'm going to knit back and forth, back and forth, picking up a few stitches on each side of the neckline as I work my way down the back. And I've cut out this shape right here that's sort of representing what I think is going to be the slope of the shoulder, the roundedness of the shoulder. Now, mind you, if I didn't have this pinned onto this panel, all these parts would just be flapping in the wind. So having this structure underneath 
was very helpful to me. However, here I am knitting. This is the angle that I'm knitting from. The needles are nearest me and the rest of the work is further away. It's a little awkward to be knitting right side and then flipping it over and doing the wrong side. So I will reiterate, it was very helpful to have this kind of board to work off of that had a certain amount of rigidity to it. And it was easy to flip everything around and keep it all pinned in place. Um, but I did struggle with the initial rows of making sure that if I was knitting on the right side, that it was lining up with the right side of the front. It didn't always feel like that. Now at this point, the back is starting to take on its own structure. And I can see over here that it's getting the shape that is desired and over here as well. And here's the back of the neck. So things are starting to gel. Here's another view of that. Looking at it top down, you can see the left front, the right front, as well as the back. And on the top is my cable of my circular needle. I think I neglected to say about one of the intermediary steps. After I did the provisional cast on and knit up and found that ridge wasn't working for me, I think I also started, yeah, I did start another back where I was just going to start at the neckline and knit down. But when I was doing the increases to broaden out towards the shoulders, those increases became those stair steps, which were the very thing that I didn't want. So that's a whole step that I overlooked mentioning, which also was a dead end. Now in this image, there's more back starting to take shape. What you can't see is that over on the edges, I really didn't complete those wedges. I wanted to get the back going and make sure that I was on track before I extended this all the way out to the shoulder line. So these two pieces are about 85% done at this stage. Here's yet another vantage point. I'm knitting over here, but I'm knitting in this direction. It's just kind of upside down and awkward, but by this time I was getting the hang of it. At this point, I have completed this entire wedge all the way to that point and this entire wedge all the way to this point. And I'm only up to about here in terms of my back and forth increasing a few stitches each time. So I still have from here to here. And at that point, I'm going to have to figure out where I'm going next because right now, I don't know. I I don't have that mapped out yet. I just know that I'm really happy, finally, with where I'm at. <laughs>